today, so I would like to get started. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, welcome. Um, just a heads up, this is a public uh, forum, so anything we discuss here will be posted publicly later on. So um, definitely not a time to be bashing people or doing anything, saying inappropriate things. And I'll try my best to restrain myself from doing that. So hello, hello. my name is Elaine Page, and uh, I am a paralegal. And um, the mo one of the moderators and group experts of the Facebook page. So before we get started, I wanted to just do a shout out to two people. Firstly, Mark Morris for everything you do for all of us in terms of education. It's really quite extraordinary what you've accomplished. I, I know your group has over 10,000 members. This group is up to 1,500 and building every day. And um, very much appreciate everything you do. And the other person that I don't know if she's here yet, but I wanted to give a shout out to Sandra Jackson, who is essentially our gatekeeper. Um, she works really hard at ensuring that the people who join this group are not spammers, um, are not, you know, phantom people. So she checks out pretty much everybody who, who gets in here. And without that, you know, things could just run amok. So it's very appreciated the work that uh, Sandra has been doing consistently for us. So Sandra, if you're here, thank you. So let me introduce to you our, our great and wonderful panel today who are all experts uh, on the Facebook page. And Denise, if you could just put your camera on so we could see your beautiful face. And then we'll we'll as we proceed we'll 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 go off camera. So here is everybody in no particular order. So Harry, give a wave, Harry. Harry Fine. A lot of you know Harry Fine. He is a former LTB adjudicator and educator. His investor training materials have helped thousands of Ontario landlords stay out of trouble. And Harry, lucky bum, no longer practices. He just recently retired. We're happy for him, but not happy for us because we do rely on him quite heavily. Um, and so he's taking some time to enjoy life and do some traveling. He is, his fun facts are, he's a sailor, a pilot. And while those are definitely important to him, the love of his life is his almost three-year-old granddaughter, Sophie. So welcome, Harry. Next, Brett. Brett Lockwood is the owner of Lockwood Paralegal Firm, and he operates out of York Region. He's a practicing uh, paralegal who focuses on both landlord and tenant issues as well as small claims court lawsuits. Brett is also licensed... <laughs> Uh, is a licensed practicing mortgage agent, which I didn't know. So we're going to have to have a chat, <clears throat> right? Um, but that certainly allows him to bring a unique perspective into his legal world. So Brett didn't give me a fun fact. So I guess Brett's just not a fun guy, but. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. I'm not very fun. <laughs> uh, next we have Denise Ranger. Give a wave, Denise. Denise. Is a founder of Ranger Paralegal Services located in mm -hmm. Oshawa with years of experience in customer service and in sales, including real estate. Denise has specialized knowledge of realty contracts and the rules that govern realtors uh, and brings that firsthand knowledge and experience to her role as a paralegal. Denise never mm -hmm. shies away from complex matters. And in her time off, Denise can be found cooking up a storm or belting out a tune at the local karaoke bar. Uh, and then we have Kathy Corsetti. And Kathy Corsetti has been specializing in landlord and tenant board matters for over 45 years. I always say that's pretty amazing since you're only 29. Um, she graduated from Humber College Law Program and has been awarded an honorary bachelor's degree. She is the owner and operator of Corsetti Paralegal uh, Professional Corporation. And Kathy is also, she's got a long, a long bio because she's done so much. But one of the important things about Kathy is she's actually a bencher at the Very. Law Society of Ontario. And um, 
And uh, and the, for those of you who don't know what ventures are, it's like being on the board of directors. Kathy's fun fact is that she used to competitively tap dance. And then last but not least is me. I'm Elaine Page, owner operator of Page Paralegal, uh, 30 years practicing in the area of um, landlord and tenant. Uh, both Harry and I are winners of the, um, or recipients, I guess is the right way to say that, of the Distinguished Paralegal of the Year by the Law Society of Ontario. And my fun fact, I got lots of them, but the one I'll tell you about is that uh, in my spare time, I'm a wedding officiant. So that is your, your gang of folks who have generously um, volunteered their time to assist you both today as well as answering your questions on the Facebook page. So we're going to jump right in. Let me tell you what we're going to be talking about today and um, and how it's going to work. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Facebook page and the rules and that kind of thing. Harry's going to lend us his expertise in lease agreements. Um, I'm just going to qualify that. Harry could talk about for about this for several days at a time because he has lots to say about it, uh, all of which is valuable. So he's going to give you a very brief overview of some of the things that you should be aware of with lease agreements. Um, Kathy is going to then share with <laughs> us some things about the Law Society and about agents' roles and responsibilities. Uh, at the Landlord and Tenant Board, as well as what's what's going on there. Brett is going to share with us the thing you desperately need to know about, which is how to properly do N12s, which are the purchasers and owners use applications. And Denise is going to also hit on a critical area called, as we know it, cash for keys. Uh, then I'll do a little wrap up. And if we have enough time, we'll try and answer some questions in the chat. So that just reminds me to tell you some things about the Facebook page. We are licensed under the Law Society of Ontario. and We have certain obligations. And Kathy is <laughs> going to talk a bit more about that. But we cannot answer. We cannot give legal advice on a Facebook page. It's as simple as that. So while we're happy to answer a general question like how much is the guideline increase rate for the year 2023, happy to do that. But what we do see are people who have these whole scenarios. My client did this and then the other side did that and da, 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 and very specific details. We can't answer those questions because we're required to under our license to do conflict checks we can't have things like phantom clients. So that's why you keep seeing that answer. And we do apologize, but we, like you, are regulated and have to follow our rules. So that's I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to, to my colleagues now to, to do their thing. So uh Harry is gonna start and then. I guess the rest of us, if we can just, um, we can turn our cameras off now and then I'll call you in as we need to. So Harry, take it away. Thank you, Elaine. I'm gonna put my PowerPoint on the screen, which uh, I'm gonna follow from. I'm not sure in this format if you see both me and the PowerPoint, do you? Or just, just the Yeah, we see you both. Oh, great, because I dressed for this. I was gonna say, I hope you're wearing pants. <laughs> I, um, I, I've actually, this past week, I. I had changed my status to the Law Society to no longer practicing, no longer accepting clients and giving opinion and advice or going to the to court with them. But uh, in my semi-retirement, I'm going to focus on my training packages that have been very uh, successful with realtors and investors, et cetera. Anyways, I'm going to talk about in my, well, 13 minutes, uh, how an ideal starting or creation of the tenancy should work. I want to preface that by saying, I know that realtors have a very unusual paradigm for attracting tenants or interviewing tenants uh, using this serial, that means one at a time uh, approach with um, uh, periods, um, you know, where they have an opportunity to uh, come forward and make an offer, et cetera, irrevocable periods. It is not the way good landlords do it. It is not the way 
a high rise REITs do it. It is not the way the small landlord who doesn't use a realtor does it. And there's a lot of flaws with the way that realtors, whether it's a RIA or RICO or just institutional memory, uh, have been doing leasing. And it creates lots of problems. And it's actually good for paralegals because we get a huge amount of business uh, through problems that were created because the tenancy didn't get started right. So I'm going to talk about what the ideal process should look like. And then, of course, you will do what you will do. I'm going to talk about the right way to select tenants, the importance of an application form, proper application form, uh, knowing who the tenant is because there's so much identity fraud today. Of course, more, the, more important than anything, due diligence uh, than the proper method of doing leases today with the standard government lease along with the Form 400. Uh, a couple of special considerations for condos. And then I want you to understand who is a tenant and who is an occupant. And that often gets confusing. Uh, I hear a lot of realtor clients say, oh, uh, one of the two tenants left. Can Does the other have to leave? Or uh, should I sign a new lease? Well, the answer is no, no, no. A tenant is a person who signs, who's a signatory to the lease. And tenants are jointly and severally responsible for all obligations uh, under the lease. And so if uh, Harry and Bill live together and Bill moves out, uh, Harry is still responsible. And Harry can bring in a roommate. And you can't have the right to approve that roommate. And you don't get a right to sign a new lease or change the rent. As long as there's one additional tenant, original tenant, person who signed the lease originally, the tenancy is ongoing. If you don't start this properly, uh, you or your clients will have terrible times, particularly today, because resolving anything at the LTB takes a year and sometimes longer. And it can get very expensive, particularly if your uh, tenant or landlord, uh, the opposing party, uh, files an appeal to the divisional court, which they have a right to do. Uh, some of you may have read about the condo case that uh, came about through the Condo Authority Tribunal last week, where a landlord just ignored their condo tenant and the bad behavior. The corporation took the uh, parties, that is the landlord and the tenant, to cat. Uh, the landlord sort of ignored the process and figured it's not my problem. And the landlord ended up with a huge cost order against them, as did the tenant. The uh, adjudicator split it. You cannot ignore condo problems. It is not a source of passive income renting out a condo. So let's start at the beginning with applications, leases, uh, and the other stuff. Some things to be careful of. Do not rent to friends, family, or their friends. Somebody who needs a place badly, they'll be gone soon. Because, of course, they won't be gone soon. Because in Ontario, tenancies can continue forever. And if you create some sort of informal tenancy without the proper structure and without the proper documentation, because they're a loved one or because they're a friend, when things turn sour, you have nothing but trouble because everything will be difficult to prove. Don't be in a hurry. It's better to lose a month's rent than get the wrong tenant because it does take a year to evict. I talked before about identity. I would not rent to somebody without seeing their driver's license in my hand. And uh, lastly, just, well, not lastly, you don't accept somebody just because they're willing to pay a year up front or they're willing to pay more than the price that you've advertised it for because a promise to pay is different from being paid. And so important, if you're the, what I will call the listing agent for the uh, landlord, you cannot simply assume the tenant's agent, if they have an agent who's a realtor, is on your side because you're you know, brothers in arms as realtors, they're not on your side. And you can't accept documents from them and have trust in them. But whenever I've had um, people say, oh, this is the best tenant ever, you should really trust them. You know, I would suggest you say to the other realtor, you know, then can you be their guarantor? Because um, once the lease is signed, the other realtor is gone. So why do we have a proper application? What's the importance of a proper application? Uh, you have an application through ARIA. I don't happen to love yours. I have my own in my warms package that you're seeing on the screen now. But the application does a lot of things besides just letting you know who they are and what they make and where they work and what their cars are and where their bank is and personal information. <clears throat> it also gives you consent to conduct a credit check or an employment check because a bank or an employer couldn't give you information without some sort of 
uh, acknowledgement of your right to do that. And it also uh, in some ways protects you because uh, the area form as it describes last month's rent deposits is incorrect, legally, factually incorrect. So you could be put in a situation because of the area form where the area application and the form 400, where if a tenant doesn't move in, you can't sue them uh, to get the deposit. Uh, they can sue you, sorry, to get the deposit back because it wasn't referenced as a proper last month's rent deposit. So uh, be careful. Um, you need a consent. Uh, obviously, you need the information to do proper screening. And remember, tenants are hard to evict, so you better get it right. It's the only time you have some control of the process is prior to the tenancy starting. Here's the way good landlords, small landlords, large landlords, do their screening. They get the applications. Uh, in your case, um, it's on MLS, and hopefully you send the applications. And once you get those, you start a pre-screening process. You may throw out those you don't like. But um, at some point, you need to schedule a showing of the unit for those who interest you. At the interview, you need to assess them because just as they're assessing you, you need to assess them. And after the showings, you'd start the verification process of the information on the applications from those who are interested. And of course, that means contacting the prospective tenant's employer, uh, not from the email address and phone number they give you, but from something you find online. Make sure you, Yuki, that's my dog. Yuki, come here. Yuki, come. She barks whenever anybody comes to Yuki, Yuki, Yuki. Good girl, you stay here. So you've got to contact the prospective employer. You've got to make sure you uh, contact the previous landlord. You've got to make sure you conduct a credit check. There's a lot of disagreement as to how much information you can ask for, but nowadays it's a landlord's market. So I would say, ask for it. Uh, review T4s, notices of assessment, pay slips. Some landlords, small landlords, who are really careful about who they rent to, find an excuse to speak to the tenant again at the place where the tenant currently lives. I know that's weird, but then you'll find out what your unit will look like a year from now. Be careful about the human rights code. Uh, be careful about what questions you ask or why you deny people. And of course, there are methods to get a guarantor if you're not happy with the covenant, but guarantors are not always great. And um, it creates a problem because you have to go after them in a separate application uh, to recover the money. So you can refuse people if they're smokers, but how do you know without seeing them? You can refuse them if they have pets. Better look at social media. Don't limit your search to the first applicant. None of this serial or revocable one at a time leasing because that's how you get in trouble at the Human Rights Tribunal. Wait until you have a few to choose from, like an offer date. And uh, of course, once you've um, selected the tenant, you need to get a last month's rent deposit. Remember, guarantors do not sign the lease. Guarantors sign a guarantor agreement. You cannot put a guarantor's name on an LTB notice or application. The LTB will not make an order against them. You need to bring a separate action against the guarantor if there's a judgment uh, against the tenant that you can't get any money from the tenant. Uh, tenants versus occupants, we've talked about it. An occupant is just someone who lives there and they have every right to live there without your permission. Be careful of condos. <laughs> well, I just told you the one about the CAT tribunal uh, this month, but you need to have a lease appendix that has a good condo clause so the tenant can't say, I didn't know it was a condo. I didn't know I had obligations under the rules, declaration and bylaws of the condo corporation. Don't forget the Condo Act, I think it's section 80 says you have to provide uh, an electronic copy of the rules, declarations and bylaws. Be careful about pets in condos. Uh, there was just a case, uh, there's a case going on right now where somebody is claiming their support animal, they're really a comfort animal and it's 50 pounds and the condo declaration says 25 pounds. So be careful because this will come back on you. Uh, obviously short-term rentals are controversial, but most condos don't allow them, so be careful what your client intends to do. The actual lease, the standard government lease, of course, now has to be used since 2018. You cannot hide on that lease. If you don't have the uh, legal name and address of the landlord on the lease, the tenant's obligation to pay rent is suspended. And remember, sections 12 and 13 of the Form 400 remind you that it's the landlord who immediately after 
accepting the tenant is required to draft the standard government lease. The form 400 is meaningless. It means something to you in terms of getting commissions, but Maria should have done a better job. Um, don't ever let the tenant or their representative come to you and say, uh, thank you for accepting us, here's the lease. You need to draft a lease because you need to put special additional clauses in. I obviously don't have time to go over these, but if you don't have these rules as additional clauses, then you don't have any right to litigate or insist on uh, these things being done. And one of the things I find most often that's the most frightening is when people signed leases without being clear about what is a, an exclusive use area, a shared use area, like a backyard, or in a restricted area like the garage that the landlord's not renting out. If you don't have that in the lease, then the landlord is, sorry, the tenant is renting the entire space. So you need to be careful about uh, additional clauses and making sure that they're complete. So putting it together, the Form 400 is an offer document only. Uh, but please put enough stuff in the schedule of the Form 400 to cover these issues. Cut and paste them out of your additional clauses from your government lease. Because what you don't want is to go through the process and then later have the tenant when they're signing the lease saying, oh, I never saw this. I never knew this. I didn't know I'm responsible for this. And that's one of the problems the Form 400, an offer, review the lease. Um, for those interested, you have showings. Once you've narrowed it, do the references, including social media checks. Make sure you've discussed with the client all their requirements. Otherwise, your additional terms won't be right because you won't understand what they're looking for in terms of the tenant's obligations. You pick your best candidate. You sign the government lease by guaranteed funds. But first, you have to draft that standard lease additional clauses so that uh, Again, the, the client's wishes are being honored in the lease that eventually gets signed. And of course, if you don't rent to somebody, never give a reason, just thank them and say, yours was great, but I preferred somebody else. Once it's signed, don't forget, tenants need to get utilities signed. You need to make sure the unit's ready for occupation. Uh, once you meet them at the unit and give them cards, keys, or fobs, they should sign an acknowledgement, get a copy of the lease, sign an acknowledgement for the lease. And something that almost nobody does, and you should all do, is to take pictures of every room, every floor, every appliance, every window, so that if there is damage, you can prove that the tenant made the damage. And in my package, I have a unit inspection report, but you need to take videos and pictures too. And of course, if it's a condo, the condo corporation uh, should be getting a copy of either a some sort of profile of the tenant or a copy of the lease. So... Those are my recommendations for keeping your clients out of trouble. Thank you, Harry. There's a couple of things I just want to add to that. Um, with respect to credit checks, uh, there's been a lot of fraudulent credit checks that have been showing up. Um, and, and so what's been happening is people are offering these credit bureaus and they're, they're fake. And the landlord relies on them and then finds out later on when they stop paying the rent that they're fake. So you must do your own credit checks. Do not do not uh, accept a credit bureau from from somebody. They think, oh, aren't I being efficient and helpful? No, they're not. There's a good chance that that might actually be fraudulent. Um, and one other thing I want to mention that Harry, I didn't give him time to mention, but I know he would have. What we what we we see all of the time are clauses in lease agreements that are completely not binding. Um, usually we see things like the first $75 of a repair is a tenant's responsibility, um, snow removal or or grass cutting is a tenant's. Um, responsibility, those, those are not binding and you should be avoiding putting them in the lease agreement. And so if you want to understand that a bit more, Harry, you know, has this a great package that he, um, has created. People often will call me and say, can you do lease clauses for me? And I say, absolutely not because Harry's already done it. And I, I certainly couldn't do a better job than him. And so I just direct them to Harry's Harry's website for that. Harry, if you Appreciate could just share. Sorry? Appreciate the plug. Thank you. 
No problem. If you wouldn't mind, though, just throwing in the chat the um, contact information for that. And if people want it, then, you know, they can grab it there. I, so I, even um, though we're no longer practicing, I still have my training website and I will put it in the chat. Right. Well. But you're sharing your right, you're sharing your screen. OK. Um, and just on a quick note, with respect to the credit bureaus, um, I did a case last year where somebody had converted, it was all over the news, they had converted a, um, a, a lovely home into a rooming house, and they were charged. And one of the ways we had them charged was because the credit bureau they provided was completely and absolutely fake. So there you go. Okay, so now I am going to turn it over to Ms. Kathy Corsetti. And Kathy, it's all, all you. There you are. I'm looking for you. It's all you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Harry. Um, thanks for everyone who's joining. I, I see we're almost 80 people, so that's great. Um, I've been asked to speak a bit about paralegals. Um, I'm sure many of you do know what a paralegal's role is but I'm going to speak to the people who don't know because we are relatively a new profession, 15 years young. And um, just so you understand what our scope is. So we are regulated by the law society like um, lawyers. Um, I've been on the board of directors for now 13 years. It's my last term. Um, we regulate paralegals and lawyers in the public best interest. So um, because of that, we have insurance, we have a code of conduct, and we are subject to discipline should we step outside our, our code of conduct and, and our, our what our bylaws state. Similar to realtors, I, I know, have the same type of regulatory body. So we also have to um, comply with the Law Society Act. And Bylaw 4, um, Part 5 of the Law Society Act, talks about providing legal services. So uh, lawyers. Um, practice law, we provide legal services. And who can and who cannot provide legal services? So um, this is more directed to realtors who possibly are stepping into providing some legal services, whether they know it or not. Um, providing, preparing any type of forms is providing legal services. Um, appearing at the LTB is providing legal services. And um, technically, you can be charged with um, practicing um, practicing law, which is not anything your intention would be. You're helping out a client. Um, the bad thing right now about any realtor who does that is a member won't hear you, and the member is the judge at the LTB. And after seven, eight, ten months waiting for a hearing date, it could get adjourned. So I think it's really important that you know this information if you didn't already, and sorry for those who know it already, but I see it all the time where a realtor shows up at, at a hearing representing a client and gets turned away. You're not doing your client any service at all. Like that is, you know, I, I suspect it could affect your insurance as well. So there's really good paralegals on this panel um, that have a lot of experience we're not that expensive. I mean, you wouldn't ask your client to close their own real estate deal without a lawyer. So don't send them to the tribunal without a paralegal, in my opinion, at least have them have a consult with a paralegal um, that can give them some proper advice. I mean, I, you know, I see even my own clients, individuals who are doing N12 and, and you know, prepare their own form, put the wrong termination date on it. And seven months later, we're at court hire me and I'm like, we got to start all over again. So to save that little couple of hundred dollars or whatever for preparing the form, they're back almost a year behind where they were before. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about is what's happening right now at the law, at the landlord and tenant board. It's broken. And anyone who's been working in it or speaking to clients or reading the news, it's in, in my 45 years of practicing, not always at the LTB, but for the majority of it, um, never, it used to be six weeks to get a hearing date. So um, now it's seven months. Right now, um, hearings L1s, which are arrears of rent that I filed in October are getting April date. So instead of seven months, it's now six months for arrears. 
I had um, a couple of cases from August. They were heard in August, L1, so arrears of rent, uh, on consent, no one showed up, straight standard order for eviction and arrears. One of them owed at that point over $25,000 in a rent. So, you know, it's been probably seven, eight months waiting to get a hearing date. And this week I get a trial de novo, meaning a brand new hearing date because the member is no longer there. So now my client's at risk of being outside the jurisdiction because the jurisdiction is 35,000. Um, and I'm sure unless the tenant has been paying, which I suspect they haven't, it's probably close to 40,000 in arrears, which is you can, you know, an individual landlord could never ever make up that money. It's, 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 it's broken. The, the LTB is just broken. So you wait seven months to get a hearing. And then right now, a normal order is I'm still waiting from August and September. So, I mean, some of them you're getting sooner. It seems to be no rhyme or reason. I don't know if it's who's writing the order or if it's, I don't know, new policies, but there's just, you know, I spend so much time answering my clients' complaints. And, and I've never had to do that in all my years. But why don't we have a hearing date? What can you do about getting a hearing date? Why do, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Never mind if there's a real estate deal closing, the issues that are involved in that. So I know um, Brett's going to be talking about N12s, which purchasers own use and what have you. But, you know, it's, it's a pretty scary market out there right now. If you're selling a property that has a tenant, I mean, unless somebody wants to wait over a year for a hearing date, if the people don't agree to move out, it's, it's a problem. Um, then there's, uh, so right now I'm, I'm L2s, which are any type of behavior or tenants app. They're even longer than the seven months getting the hearing date. So again, listen to Harry about doing your checks because you get a bad tenant in there. They're gonna live there for over a year. Other tenants are moving out because of this tenant's behavior. It's a huge risk to um, the landlord. And unfortunately, there's absolutely nothing and experienced paralegals like us can do about it. You know, they say, oh, file a request to shorten time. I have filed requests to shorten time to get an earlier hearing date in absolutely unbelievable situations where it's a hoarder where my client's being charged by the city $10,000 a day. And it's been right now, it's been over eight months, we've been waiting for a hearing date. So um, really be careful who you're putting in those units, do a proper credit check, um, I, I believe over all the years I've been doing this, that there are tenants who look for individual landlords, which would be your clients. Um, and, you know, can, you know, nobody expects someone to be not truthful, but they're not truthful. They have forged credit checks. They have forged uh, employment letters, et cetera, et cetera. So you really have to look into that. Uh, make sure that you are um, sure who you're putting in their uh, phone references and hopefully it's not their friend that they put down as a reference etc so um that's really all i have to say unless anyone has any questions about what's happening at the ltb but i i hate to say it but it's broken and it it's not getting any better and um maybe by a month it's better her earlier hearing dates but we have no other avenue and this is the way we have to um it's the only only way we can get a, an eviction order. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you, Kathy. I just want to add a couple points to what what you said. Um, so Kathy was talking about the length of time it's taking to get orders, and in particular, the one adjudicator who has either been fired or has left the building. Uh, recently, there was an uh, article in CBC, which was my client, who's been waiting for an order. Um, it took him, you know, seven months to get to a hearing. We've been waiting seven months for an order. So he hasn't received any rent for at least 14 months, if not longer. And he, um, it has caused him such uh, hardship that he's actually threatening suicide. And even in that situation, I couldn't get an expedited uh, uh, hearing. And he wrote to the board and said, if I don't get an order in the next week, I will kill myself. They, so that's how bad it is. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just say with respect to what Kathy said was that, 
you know, a lot of times agents just think, oh, this is quick, quick and easy money. I'll just approve someone. They don't bother to do the work and to check the backgrounds, which is frankly your job. And it, in comes a really horrific tenant. And we discover that everything the tenant has provided is fraudulent. And those real estate agents are now getting sued because they did not do their job. And I'm not entirely sure whether their insurance covers it, but the brokerages and um, the uh, agents are getting sued. So in the case that I'm talking about, the agent did not do the job properly. The landlord will lose probably $35,000 by the time we get the um, tenant out and that agent in all likelihood will get sued. So that is the warning to you that if you're doing lease agreements for your clients, you need to take it seriously. So I'm going to move on. Thanks, Kathy. And we're going to take some questions at the end if we have time. I am. I just also wanted to give um, a shout out to Mark. Mark, where are you? I, I'm here. No. Hi there. Other Mark. <laughs> Wrong Mark. <laughs> I'm I'm here, but my my camera's off because I'm yeah, I'm lying so, down in bed. Ah, uh, okay. So Mark Levy is another one of the paralegals who is part of this group who um, frequently answers questions for everybody. And Mark, we appreciate that, and thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to turn this over to the illustrious but not fun <laughs> Brett Lockwood. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Mark Levy, too. I uh, hope you're feeling better, I guess. Um, all right. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about N12s. Now, N12s are very loaded. Um, lots goes on with an N12, especially when uh, realtors are involved, because what's very important for realtors to remember is you need to be working with the other side. What do I mean by the other side? Buyer and seller. So if you're representing a seller who is a landlord, and the buyer intends to move in, buy the property and move in, you will need their cooperation because in essence, what's happening is you're filing uh, an application on their behalf. So the buyer, the landlord, uh, sorry, the seller, the landlord is, is trying to evict a tenant for the buyer. So let me just pull up my screen here. So the uh, Residential Tenancies Act is the act that governs, basically it, the board derives their power from the, from the RTA amongst other um, statutes. But what we're talking about specifically in this case would be under section 49. Now section 49, as everyone can see here, is that a purchaser personally requires a unit. So in essence, what happens is you, you're gonna start the process um, and, and generally, you know, they hire, paralegals to start from the beginning. We always like that because uh, we know that everything's done properly and uh, everything's in order. Uh, but at least giving the landlord the knowledge could come from a realtor and you could direct them to this section. So section 49, as you can see, is called notice purchaser personally requires a unit. There are a lot of, you know, it's a very loaded section. So for instance, when you read it, it says a landlord of a residential complex that contains no more than three residential units. These are things you're going to have to explain um, to your to your clients that uh, not every uh, unit that's sold actually can apply. It goes on to say that they have entered into an agreement of purchase and sale. Therefore, important wording here already has entered into the agreement. Uh, often, what happens is we we get cases that we take over that there was actually no agreement of purchase and sale. Application is going to fail. Here, you're filing on behalf of the purchaser that you're giving the tenant, and these are the following people who can move in. Now, other words, other things that are important that I kind of skipped over, good faith. So in good faith, we need that the purchaser of this property is going to be moving in. It could be the purchaser, as you see here, purchaser spouse, child or parent of the purchaser, or care services. And care services is also defined in the act. Now, often we get questions, you know, simple questions like, you know, it says three residential units, but uh, I have a condo unit. Am I allowed to actually, um, you know, do an N12? That's covered under here, under subsection two, where it talks about condominium. Now, just so everyone's clear, this is what an N12 form looks like. And as you can see, 
what I just read is covered under reason two. I have signed an agreement of purchase and sale. The wording of the act actually a little bit different that you entered into it. Same thing. You have an agreement of purchase and sale and the landlord in theory is going to have to check off who's moving in. Now, remember that the landlord is doing this on behalf of the purchaser. So you need all this, all this information. It's helpful if some of this information is actually in the agreement of purchase and sale. So for instance, if a mother is buying a condominium and her son is going to be moving in, you're probably going to want to put in there that they, they, they require vacant possession because the son is moving in. Um, and then of course, in, in this, in that situation, you'd be reason to the purchaser's child. Going back to the act, you would have to give proper notice. So in, it, it, it used to apply a lot more where the, you know, so we used to get hearings back in the day before the termination date. So the termination date is, is essentially what we're talking about here, the period of notice that you're giving the, the, the tenants. We used to have it before COVID that we could get a hearing date before that termination date. Now it's not as important. The termination dates are, you know, five, six, seven months now before we have hearings. But in that sense, you need to give proper notice to the tenant about what's going on. And that's where communication with the between the buyer and seller is important because the you know it's all it's all, it's all about managing expectations. Um, if somebody's buying a house, condo, whatever it is. And they expect that this process is going to take two months and that they're going to have the place before the termination date. Unlikely. Um, and that's where, and, and I know Denise is going to talk about, um, you know, cash for keys and all this stuff and, you know, ways around perhaps using N12, but managing expectations and working together is extremely important. Other things that are very important for um, you guys to know and share with clients, of course, is here that the tenant has the ability to leave early. Of course, that would be a dream scenario for any of us that the tenant just gets their notice and they say, you know what? Okay, I'm willing to leave. They can give notice. Uh, it has to be at least 10 days after they've, given the, after they've been given the notice. Other important things also are this compensation. It's somewhat of a new section that came into play, you know, COVID time or a little bit before it was talked about is that you would have to compensate the tenant one month's rent. That compensation has to be given by the termination date that you put on your notice. If it's not done, application will fail. You're, we're going to be waiting six, seven, eight, nine months. We get to the hearing, no compensation, application dismissed. So the most important thing is communication, of course, between the parties, buyer and seller. Also, when you're filing these sorts of applications, we need uh, a declaration or an affidavit. So that is a declaration or an affidavit from the individual moving in. So once again, it's usually nice if the realtors are talking to one another and they could provide us already a declaration or an affidavit from the person who's moving in saying, I'm going to be moving in. This is my plan. Um, they vary. Some of them are very detailed. Some of them are very bare. But in essence, that needs to be filed when you file your application. If, you, if we don't have that, it just delays everything. Often what happens is if we don't have that, then it'll be someone like me who's reaching out to maybe the realtor or the purchaser, whomever it is, trying to arrange to get this document signed. And that honestly can delay, uh, as I'm sure you guys can figure out, weeks sometimes. Um, and you know every day counts in this sort of scenario. So that is in essence in like about a five minute explanation for how this purchaser's own use works. So client is giving out an N12, tenant gets it. Tenant in theory does not have to leave. Tenant, the, in, the only person who, or thing that can tell the tenant in this scenario to leave is the landlord and tenant board. There are lots of tenants who fight. They understand the rental market's not great and they, you know, they hang on for as long as possible. And we go through the process and 10 months later, we get a hearing day and have to evict. Even at the hearing, we don't, in theory, know what the answer is going to be, whether the tenant's going to be evicted. The board delays in issuing the, their orders, sometimes one, two, three months it could be. Um, this whole process, once again, very important that everyone understands that um, manage expectations. That's all this really is at this point. Um, managing how long things will take, protecting your clients so they understand 
there may be built in, maybe there should be built in clauses in the agreement of purchase and sale about delays. I'm not going to touch on that. I'm not a, I'm not a real estate lawyer, but um, there could be clauses about delays or moving the uh, closing date, anything like that. The other option that sometimes may apply with realtors is uh, where the, the, they, you represent a buyer and you close on the deal. And then the client decides, you know what, I'm going to be moving in now. So in that situation, we're not looking at section 49 where it's a purchaser. Now they are, they have become the landlord. So now we're looking at section 48 and that's where a landlord themselves requires the unit. Very similar in nature. One of the major differences that I'll point out right now is that um, the landlord who moves in would have to live there for at least one year. Um, it's happened a lot recently where, where um, realtors have called me because they've had a very good, um, you know, they're, they found a very good deal for their clients. And they're like, what happens if we close and then my guy decides to move in? And I just simply tell them, listen, there's a remedy for that. You may want to put in the agreement of purchase and sale the intentions of your client, although it's not necessary. And basically the application is the same process. We're just relying on a different section of the app. In that case though, they have to move in within a reasonable time. And there's this one year that is uh, very important for clients to understand that they, you know, you can't move in, get the tenant out, move in for, you know, five months, get leave, then rent it for double what it was before. That uh, opens the, uh, your client up to a T5 application, um, damages, whatever it is. Um, I, I, I strongly recommend realtors read section 48 and 49. If it's for your own practice, uh, it, it, those are probably the two major sections that you'll run into in theory, in terms of buying and selling. And you should know these sections, not very long. You can see, um, those are very key for you to understand. Um, other than that, that, that's Elaine, that's really bare bones. I, I don't want to go too, too in depth. I just want everyone to understand that these lengthy and every case is a little bit different. So, um, we do need in theory, like for instance, when we get to a hearing, we may need the purchaser to be there. We may need the purchaser's kid to be there. These are all things that if you communicate between the realtors and everyone understands kind of what's going on how long it's going to take, what's required. Someone may need to testify at the board. As long as everybody kind of understands that, these in theory work pretty seamless. It's just a loaded, it's a loaded scenario where, you know, um, you know, everyone's a little bit different. Every case is a little bit different. Every, every purchaser maybe has a different motive. Um, and those are all things that we kind of have to work out and talk to uh, all parties before the hearing. Great. Thank you, Brett. Can you unshare your screen? Oh, Brett, there we All go. Right. Thank you. That's okay. A couple things to Thank add people. to what Brett said, and there were some questions which we'll get to as well. Um, one of the things that you should be aware of is if the if the landlord is a corporate entity, um, then you cannot use section 48 or 49. You, you can't evict, a corporation cannot evict for personal use. You actually have to have a person, not a legal uh, entity. And, and so we sometimes have investors who have various properties under corporate numbers. So that's one thing. The other recommendation that I would have, and this arises out of the fact that we all get these panicked calls where an N12 has been served. It's now two weeks before closing and the tenant announces they're not leaving. Um, and so we have to deal with that on a continuum. But one of the things that people do is they do a 60 day notice on the N12 and they wait the 60 days and then they issue the application. You don't have to do that. We recommend, because as Kathy indicated, the backlogs at the board, we recommend starting the application as soon as the N12 has been served. Uh, you know, you may not need to go that far, but at least you're in the queue. And if you wait the two months, then you're now looking at nine months before a hearing. I think it's really critical that um, realtors know 
about the delay at the board, because often you get folks who want to close in two months, which is not unreasonable under normal circumstances. But um, if the tenant uh, refuses to leave, you can't close if you've got a vacant possession clause within your agreement of purchase and sale. So you really need to be mindful of the timelines. It doesn't make it easy. The last thing I'll say on this is that as creative as you all think you are in terms of figuring out how to shorten time or manipulating the system, somebody else has already thought of it and tried it and it's not going to work. So we're very staunch about if you want to go down this path, you must follow the rules. As creative as you may be in solution uh, solutions, it's not going to work. So um, there are some questions in the chat. We'll come back to those after Denise is done. And thank you, Brett, appreciate it. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to Denise, who's gonna talk about what happens when, as, as Brett and I have been discussing, we've got a two month closing, we've served the N12 and the tenant isn't vacating. And now we're looking at a cash for keys deal. So take it away, Denise. We have lost Denise. Are you oh, there? I am here. I'm just uh, okay. unclicking and, and unmuting. So um, excellent. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Uh, can everybody see that? No, we can't see. Uh, now we can. Yep. Okay, good. Good. All righty. Let's see. Excellent. Okay, so in Ontario, if a residential tenancy is governed by the Residential Tenancies Act, then there are only three ways to end that tenancy. The tenants um, give notice and they vacate accordingly. Um, the landlord serves notice and files an application and then waits for a hearing. Or the parties can enter into uh, um, an agreement to mutually end the tenancy. Cash for keys agreements are basically what we call these types of agreements, and they're becoming ex uh, increasingly popular with landlords who are looking to avoid lengthy and expensive e uh, eviction proceedings. Right. So what's a cash for keys agreement? Basically, a cash for keys agreement is an agreement between landlords and tenants where the tenants are usually given money and some other consideration for leaving the rental property in good condition and on time. Uh, it can help the landlord to, again, avoid the costs, um, uh, uh, costly um, proceedings uh, that consume eviction processes, and tenants can get some money to help them with their um, relocation costs. Um, cash for keys are uh, is a legal um, agreement. Um, both, but both parties need to agree to the terms. Okay. And so we've talked about some of the benefits for landlords avoiding costly uh, eviction proceedings. And it will take um, they'll get possession of the property sooner, and it provides a degree of certainty. As Brent has um, already discussed, even when you get to the landlord tenant board, there's no guarantee that your um, your matter is going to um, end in an eviction. There's no guarantee that you're going to get your order of an eviction within a reasonable amount of time. So um, these types of agreements can provide some some certainty. Um, now for the for the tenants, um, obviously there's the financial compensation component to uh, assist with the relocation costs. Um, but sometimes it can also help um, the tenant to avoid a negative consequence if there is an eviction. So once upon a time, the landlord tenant board used to issue orders with the names of the parties um, redacted to just the initials um, to, I guess, preserve the, the identity of the parties so that it wouldn't uh, hamper them in the future. However, the landlord tenant board is now required to issue decisions with full names of the parties intact. Um, this means that anonymity of the parties is no longer a guarantee. 
So in a situation, for example, where the relationship between the landlord and the tenant is strained, um, quite often I see in my in my business that it uh, sometimes has a lot, something to do with arrears of rent. Um, sometimes there's other conduct issues. Um, and so uh, re, uh, maintaining anonymity can be um, a factor in motivating these parties to reach an agreement before getting all the way to the landlord tenant board for a hearing. Um, now, quite often I hear, um, you know, what kind of compensation are we talking about? Um, so the amount of cash payment is always negotiable and it depends on a number of different factors like whether or not there's arrears, whether or not there is um, conduct issues on either side of the, uh, of the um, relationship. Um, I've uh, basically what it comes down to is you're going to end up paying an amount of compensation is whatever it takes to persuade the tenant to relinquish their right, uh, the rights to the rental unit. If you've got a really good landlord tenant relationship, the tenants are good, the landlord is good, they just need the property, then in my experience, you're going to end up paying more because you're going to have to give those tenants something that's going to actually entice them to relinquish their rights. Um, on that note, I've negotiated agreements where the tenants received five thousand dollars, and on and you know on other uh, situations where the tenants received thirty seven thousand dollars, and kind of anything in between. Um, and very much like a real estate deal, no transaction is is exactly the same, but they're all very similar. Um, now, because the agreement um, to end a tenancy is a contract. Um, if a party fails to fulfill their obligations, there are consequences. Um, if a tenant signs an agreement and then fails to vacate, the landlord could apply to the landlord tenant board for an expedited process to evict the tenant. Um, if the landlord fails to follow through on their obligations, then the tenant can file an application against the landlord. Um, parties should also speak to accountants about the effects of these agreements. Um, it's, uh, it, it's been brought to my attention that cash for keys payment may be considered taxable income, um, especially if you're dealing in large or more significant sums. So that's something to have your clients be aware of, um, whether they're on the landlord side or especially if they're on the tenant side, um, and they receive a payment, um, that could affect their, uh, their tax bracket. Um, it's also important for landlords uh, and tenants to carefully consider and negotiate the terms uh, and conditions in the cash for keys agreement to ensure that both parties are protected by the agreement and that it's a fair, it's fair and reasonable. Um, I have definitely seen situations where the parties end up back at the landlord tenant board um, because the tenant uh, failed to understand or comprehend the uh, ramifications of signing such an agreement. Um, they weren't provided an opportunity to, to get uh, individual or independent legal advice. Um, and as a result, um, the deal fell apart or the agreement fell apart. And now the parties are back in litigation. Um, if that happens and, and a landlord is, um, uh, sorry, if that happens and a realtor has been in the, in the mix doing the negotiating, um, there may be some implications for, uh, for your E&O, for whether or not you're going to be brought into uh, litigation as well. I, I know on my, in, in my office, I've got a couple of files that are heading that way where we're actually serving and, and looking at bringing uh, um, uh, cases against the, the, the realtors for negligence. Um, so that's to be um, taken into consideration. So frequently asked questions. Oh my goodness, um, we're gonna. I'm gonna try and hit these now, uh, really quickly. Or Elaine, are we out of time? Should we leave these for another day? Um, if you wanted to grab a couple more minutes, uh, I think the information is important. So please go okay. ahead. Okay, excellent. So the. Um, uh, typical terms and conditions that go into a cash for keys agreement in my office, well, on, in anybody's office, should be obviously the, um, the amount of cash the, um, that the payment is going to be, uh, deadlines for the tenants to vacate the rental property, um, provisions dealing with how the last month's rent will be applied, uh, provision that the tenant will not damage the rental property, um, a clause that states the consequences if the tenant does not vacate, 
uh, provision that the parties have had the opportunity to seek legal advice prior to entering the agreement. And of course, a provision for the parties um, to sign an N11 agreement to end a tenancy, which is the um, proper form um, that is required under uh, as per the Landlord Tenant Board and the Residential Tenancies Act. So those are just some of the provisions. Um, and then another really frequent question I get asked is, oh my gosh, isn't this just flat out extortion? Um, no. <laughs> um, so a cash for keys agreement is not extortion if it is entered into voluntarily and by both um, by both parties. Um, extortion typically involves the use of threats and coercion or force to obtain something from somebody, um, usually money or property. In a cash for keys agreement, the tenant is not being forced to vacate. Um, the rental unit or um, and the landlord is not being forced to pay any money, but rather both parties are voluntarily entering into this agreement where the tenant agrees to vacate the property um, in exchange for cash payment from the landlord. And as long as both parties agree to the, the terms and conditions of the agreement, then there is no coercion or force involved. It's not considered extortion, which is why um, in my previous point, it is very important to give the parties the opportunity to seek independent legal advice and not to rush this process through. Um, and that basically takes care of the end of my part of the pro, uh, um, presentation. I do have uh, a PDF version of this um, presentation, so I will be uploading it to the web um, to the chat group so that people can go in and take a look at it. Um, and I've got some links in there to a more robust article on my on my website for people to 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 utilize as a as a tool. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Denise. Appreciate it. No problem. Sure, excuse me. I just want to, again, piggyback onto some stuff that Denise has said. I, I mean, and here's the reality. If you don't have vacant possession, you may not be able to close your deal. And the, the amount of money that you may end up being liable for, for failure to close, can be significantly high. And we're seeing lots of those files coming down the pipe now because of uh, failure to close. So while 20 or $30,000 seems like a lot of money, it, it actually is a lot of money. The reality is that, you know, you're dealing with a $2 million property and the lawsuit that could incur in the event that you don't close could be significantly higher than the 20 or $30,000. Um, why am I saying twenty or thirty thousand dollars? Because there's been a lot of stuff published by tenants groups recently about what the going rates are. And some tenants are very reasonable. They'll say, you know what? I'm entitled to compensation of one month. I need first and last, and I need some moving expenses. So let's just do five, six thousand dollars. We're good to go. Um, and other tenants use it as a way of, um, uh, manipulating the situation and taking advantage of the landlord and and will I mean I had one guy yesterday who asked me for a hundred thousand uh, dollars and he's in an eleven hundred dollar unit so it's it's all over the place but um, there are Facebook groups where there are tenant advocates um, consistently talking about what these asks should look like and to basically hold the landlords hostage until you get your asking price. So be forewarned. Um, before, I'm gonna just take a quick look and see if there's any questions. But before I do that, I just wanted to let you all know that on the Facebook page is a contact information sheet that was created. There's a spreadsheet. Um, and uh, if you wanna get in touch with any of us, we're all, including Mark Levy, we're all on that sheet. So instead of me trying to, you know, put it all into the chat now, that's where to find it. It, it lives there. So um, I would like to just take a second. I don't know if there's any questions. I know there's been some stuff in the chat and people have um, responded to that. Is there any, if you have a question, if you could put your hand up and if we're able to, we will answer a few of them because we're getting tight on time. Anybody? Well, uh, I'm going to go into the chat. Um, 
And so there's a question, is tenant is responsible for utilities, they move out, but still owe the money, is a landlord on the hook? Depends on the utility. If it's water uh, and sewage, it'll automatically get put onto your taxes if it doesn't get paid. There is a new application or relatively new application available at the Landlord and Tenant Board um, to go after a tenant after they vacated for non-payment of rent, for damages, and for utilities. Um, you do need to find out where your, your former tenant is residing, which is sometimes quite problematic. There are skip tracers available who, for a cost, will track them down, um, but it is one of the requirements. Okay, anybody else? And Harry, I see Harry is answering questions. All I've right. Got a question. Yep, go ahead. Hey, sorry, I couldn't find the raise my hand button. Um, Darren Johnston here. Can I add a um, cash for keys as a schedule to an N11? So basically, when I do N11s, and I'm sure my colleagues are probably doing similar types of thing. Um, I firstly contact the tenant, negotiate the whatever those terms may be, and then I formalize it in an agreement. And uh, and in and part of that agreement is the signing of an N11. And they don't get any money until I've got those documents back. So I certainly wouldn't be attaching it to an N12. Um, like I don't think that's appropriate at all. In fact, I I consider that overly aggressive. Okay, and anybody else? I have a question. N12, yep. can it, um, the APS, can it be a conditionally signed APS or does it have to be firm for an uh, N12? Uh, it has to be firm to get an eviction. If there's any still outstanding clauses like inspection, funding, which probably by the time it goes to hearing, it wouldn't be, but it has to be a firm offer. You can file it sooner at the LTB, but you won't get an eviction if, if, it's, um, if it's not a, a final binding offer. Okay, and the only so thing I, 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 I wanted to add, Elaine, with what you said about don't give money until you get keys ever like because then you've given them ten thousand dollars and and you and they haven't vacated yeah so what i do kathy is i structure it because people are financially strapped and they can't afford first and last and moving expenses so i divide it into two payments they get some money on upon signing and they get money on the day that they leave and if they don't leave then the money that we've paid them is now due and owing back to us. And I do the same sort of thing where I used to, except I'd also add a clause that a part of the money could be paid if they could present the landlord with a firm signed lease for a new place. Great idea. And, and usually to be truthful, I don't get people signing agreements until they've actually found another place. So that makes really good sense, Harry. Okay. So if there's no more questions, um, Denise. Can I ask one more? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I think this is for Brett, most likely. Um, so the APS already calls for vacant possession, but does a buyer agent need to include a condition about the listing agent directing the seller to give notice? No, to well, you can, you should. Actually, what the most important part, I think Harry put in the comments, and I completely agree with him. The most important thing to put actually in the APS is that the buyer is going to be providing an affidavit or a declaration to support an application at the landlord and tenant board. That really speeds things up and it makes it more clear. The, the, the whole point of putting this stuff in the APS is not, none of it really matters to the board in theory. The reason it's important is because it shows good faith. It shows what the parties thought about and what their, their mind, where their mind was when the deal is signed and, and Brett, so if, you're, if good faith is questioned at the at the hearing it's like are you actually going to move in or not all you have to do is say like yeah we turned their mind to this seven months ago in the aps as That's you know Brett, part. as you know brett they changed the rules so you can't even file the l2 until you have an affidavit from the person who in good faith wants to move in exactly. so i tell seller uh landlords that if the purchaser will not as a condition on the aps 
give you an affidavit from the person who in good faith says they're going to move in, then it's BS and don't go there. Good advice, Harry. Okay. So I am going to, um, so Denise and Kathy and Harry, could you come back so we could see, well, you're there, so we can see your faces. Uh, so just on behalf of the gang here today, uh, I want to thank you all for attending. And we're looking forward to uh, answering your questions on Facebook. And eventually we'll be setting up some more of these that are very targeted. For example, we, you know, I'd like to do one on specifically on condominiums for uh, as, as like an hour on condominiums. Um, so if there's things that you want to know for our next webinar, please let us know. You can see, you can PM me through the Facebook and I'll add them to our list. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank Mark for um, setting this up for us and certainly our speakers who bring such a wealth of knowledge. I really appreciate you coming and taking the time. So I will with that say have a wonderful and safe Friday because I think we're getting another storm today and look forward to seeing you again sometime in the near future. Thanks, everyone.